electricity. These are the kind of numbers you, that you get as the cost of the shocks, the, these shocks. This is basically a 40-day cuts in Bapton, Easington, and Milford Haven. As you can see on the left-hand side, you're looking at something in the reference and low carbon scenarios, you're looking about the costs in terms of lost energy of between one and three billion pounds associated with the loss of these in these scenarios. The very interesting thing is in the resilient scenarios, these costs are very much lower. In fact, the system can ride through the ease of loss of Easington, it can ride through the loss of Milford Haven, and even the back loss of Bacton, which is the most, the most important facility, is not nearly so large. And one of the reasons for that is because in the resilient scenarios, the use of gas for, in the residential sector is very much less. It's made the gas demand less peaky, and the system is able to ride through it when you look, at, look through it in more detail. Also, a set of issues that there are changes in the system costs. Uh, for example, as you uh, as you as the system adjusts, the power system redispatches. And basically, the interesting message there is that is that then, even in the resilient and low carbon resilient scenarios, these system cost changes tend to be higher. But the system is accommodating to allow you to continue to supply energy to people. So there's a balance between that. But clearly, just to emphasize, you look at the left-hand vertical axis, the costs associated with a system change are an order of magnitude less than the costs associated with uh, the, um, with the, with, with the uh, unserved energy. Now, one other piece of analysis we did was to uh, look at possible strategic investments that would mitigate these shocks. In other words, the market will deliver LNG terminals, it will deliver storage facilities up to the point, up to a certain point. But beyond the point where the market will deliver, you might want to put in place additional facilities that are stimulated through the regulatory system that would help to reduce the costs of these shocks as they came through. So these are a set of options that we looked at and tested the degree to which they would mitigate the size of the shocks that we'd hypothesized. Again, I won't need to go through them, but the storage facilities, extra LNG terminals, new gas interconnectors, and also storing distillate oil at combined cycle gas turbine stations, which would help you write things out if there were interruptions in gas supply. And I think there was a... There was a, a this slide is far too complicated, and I've given up. Uh, I've given up trying to do it. Just to say, the blue line with the squares on it shows you the degree to which uh, a 40-day outage at Bacton would mit the costs would be mitigated if you made each of these uh, each of these investments. As you can see, it's a substantial sum of money. It's of the order of of uh, one to one and a half billion pounds. So these are significant investments in new facilities, but you could perhaps justify these in terms of the reduced vulnerability to disturbance that you would get. But I have to say this is quite an interesting piece of work because Ofgem have picked up on it as well and under project discovery that they ran, they did a lot of similar stress testing of the UK system to see how successfully it, it could ride out these changes. Now, I'll just quickly run through the environment, environmental sensitivities uh, work that we did. And here, one of the things that we did, I mean, we, we tend to be obsessed about carbon dioxide as the, the total measure of environmental impact of the energy sector. We have to be conscious that there are other kinds of impacts as well. There are other atmospheric emissions, there's issues about water use and water availability, and certain of the options, especially bioenergy, have big Im Im impacts on land take and land use. So we wanted to explore the implications of these four core scenarios in terms of other things. And I think, I, I think it's, it, it's fair to say that if you look at atmospheric emissions, it was, the, it was the scenarios that had resilience built into them that performed best in terms of reducing atmospheric emissions. And this is simply because you have a smaller energy system because you've got demand driven down further. And that's the, that, that's the plain driver for it. And I don't think I really need to go through the slides. You can see it's broadly speaking, you know, a good set of stories for the low carbon scenario as well. But it mostly it performs better if you drive down energy demand and build in the resilience. That's not so true with the other scenarios. Uh, we looked at radioactivity 
radioactive emissions and land take. And there, uh, the, the, the low carbon and low carbon resilient scenarios had the highest level of emissions <coughs> or, or land take. And this is because of the greater use of bioenergy and the greater use of nuclear power in, in these, these particular scenarios. So a mixed picture there, but we just wanted to highlight that you know that these that these uh, changes make a difference. We will have different impacts on uh, the environment going forward, depending on which path we choose to take. Now this was by far probably the more interesting part of the environmental work we did, because we uh, hypothesised that there might be political, social concerns about different types of technologies that would constrain their uptake to mean that they wouldn't play a part in the energy future going forward. And for this, we hypothesized three different flavors of environmentalism that might affect the way the energy system developed. And we thought of nice and catchy names for them. Our first variant, which we applied to the low carbon scenario, was something called we called dread. And that is based on you know psychological literature. People don't like unknown technologies and tend to resist them. And that has really been the idea, that's a lot of the source behind resistance to nuclear power in the past. It's the unfamiliarity of the technology. We put in a scenario called eco, which was much more, a, a more kind of sophisticated environmentalism, concerned about uh, e the impacts of the energy system on ecosystem services. And finally, we, we had one uh, called NIMBY, which was fairly obviously one where people were concerned about the local impacts of en energy, a sense of place, you know, changing landscape would be something that you would worry about. So we explored the way that these three different flavors of environmentalism might affect your ability to pursue the low carbon scenario. And they all met the 80% reductions target, as I say. So. For example, these are the set of technologies that we constrained off depending on the kind of environmentalism that you, you hypothesized. In the dread scenario, it was unfamiliar stuff that was shut off. So nuclear power, no more nuclear, no coal carbon capture and storage. I mean, obviously, you, in certain parts of continental Europe, carbon storage is causing a great deal of uh, public disquiet. And we also shut off hydrogen as a possibility as well. So that was one set. Uh, the eco set, we actually globally put up fossil fuel prices internationally on the basis that this was probably a world in which you would not want to drill in the Arctic or in certain deep water places, and this would have impacts on global energy prices. We, uh, we let the wind go forward, but we cut back on bioenergy in both imports and domestic because of concerns about biodiversity and water appropriation. We shut off the, the Severn Barrage, which the model never picks any, up, up anyway, and we constrained off some issues around uh, tidal stream and wave energy, restricted the amount that was allowed. And finally, the NIMBY scenario, that's uh, where we shut it. Again, you know, some, we allowed nuclear power to develop at existing sites, but not any new sites going forward to 2050. We allowed coal CCS again at existing stations. We allowed offshore wind to go ahead, but had effective moratorium on onshore wind because of the local concerns about visual landscape. And we played a bit of a nuanced game with, with, with bioenergy, with the constraining it back again. And it's worthwhile saying that this really had huge impacts on the kind of electricity generation and the shape of the energy system that you got, as you can understand. So the left-hand column is the, uh, the, the uh, low carbon scenario, which by 2050 have lots of coal fire power stations with carbon capture and storage, plus a lot of nuclear power. The NIMBY scenario cut out the coal CCS. It still allowed quite a lot of nuclear power to come through, but that coal CCS was replaced by huge amounts of wind energy coming onto the system. Eco, eco scenario, uh, it, it actually allowed a bit more nuclear power into the system, uh, and, but actually there was a bigger, there, there was actually a bigger electricity demand in the eco scenario because of, of various effects. But it was the dread scenario where we knocked out nuclear and coal CCS that induced more ra most radical change because we had about 70 or 80% of the electricity.